the intimations on the back of the order of service, but just to draw your attention to our annual Guild Barbecue event, which will be on Friday the 25th of August from half past six. The tickets are now available uh, from Helen or from Alison from today onwards. A good fun evening. Through our hymns and songs, our prayer and meditation, the joining of our lives in fellowship, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Enfold us in your love and empower our worship that your name might be glorified in this place and in our lives. We sing our first hymn, number 112, God, whose almighty word, 112. intercedes for us. As a new week opens, may we take from this service small seeds of insight to plant them in the world, that in those places where our feet pass, there may be signs of the kingdom's growth. 
We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. First reading comes from the Psalms, Psalm 119, starting at verse 129, and the page numbers are on your order of service. That's Psalm 119, starting at verse 129. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The upholding of your words gives the word, give words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and plant longing for your commands. Plant longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from the oppression of men that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. The New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 33. 33. To, to 31 to 33 and 44 to 52. <clears throat> he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Through it is, though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows it's the largest in the garden, plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch on its branches. He told them this still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through dough. Then at verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for a fine for fine pearls, and when he found one of the great of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fishes. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. Here there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all the things, these things Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. May God add to us his blessing through the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Heather. 
We sing again number 608, Spirit of Truth and Grace, 608. <laughs> some children here to listen to it. However, you'll just have to do instead. <laughs> when you walk past Woolies in Brodick or the big house down here in Shiskin, Blackwaterfoot, do you ever pause and take a deep breath and breathe in the smell of the bread baking? Absolutely wonderful. When John left the army, and came to Shiskin here to farm. He was in the habit of going to the bakery on his bike to get a freshly baked loaf of bread. He'd put the still warm bread in the basket on the front of his bike and cycle home. Yep, you guessed it. By the time he got there, there was nothing left. <laughs> Have you ever tried making bread? Only three ingredients are needed. Flour, water, and yeast. Some bakers add other ingredients like salt or sugar or eggs or milk, which makes the bread taste good, but it isn't. none of these are essential for a loaf of bread. And it's the yeast that makes the bread rise and become light and tasty. Did you know that yeast is actually a living fungus found in the air? So we're all breathing it in. To make bread, you need 500 grams of strong white flour, that's a pound in old money, a seven gram sachet of fast action yeast, or an ounce, and 300 ml of water.
water, which is about half a pint. And this small amount of yeast, when combined with the flour and the water, grows and forms gas bubbles all through the bread dough, causing it to rise. So it's the yeast that causes the bread to rise and change its shape. And Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Leavened bread is bread that's had the yeast added to it and it's risen. Now, the phrase three measures of flour is important for two reasons. First, one measure is not equivalent to one cup or one pound. Actually, scholars estimate that three measures of flour would yield 40 to 60 pounds of dough. I did the sums for you. One pound of flour yields approximately one loaf of bread. So this woman is baking 60 loaves of bread. Our image of a young woman baking at home has just got a wee bit different. The image is now one, actually, of extravagance. For no one woman could need such a large amount of dough. And nor, I like to think, could one family consume all that in a day. We might be reminded of stories with similar overabundance of food, such as the wedding at Cana or the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus is teaching us that something very small, like yeast, can be powerful and bring about change. And think of small acts of kindness and love as being like yeast. And what are some of the ways you can share your love? Well, very simply, a smile, a kind word, being helpful. When you show love, other people will be able to see the kingdom of heaven in you and your small acts of kindness may cause others to grow in love and become more than they were. So don't ever underestimate the power of your love. We sing again, number 596. Breathe on me, breath of God. 596.
together once more in prayer as we offer our prayers of thanksgiving and for others. Let us pray. O oh God, if you are for us, who is against us? You've given us your Son, and through him you give everything else as well. We have a shelter from the storm. We have nourishment for body and soul. We are held forever in the love of Christ, from which nothing can separate us. So for all the signs of your care and favour, we bring our thanks in word and gift and promise. And now we pray for others. We pray for our wonderful and troubled world. In some places, the violence of war tramples and crushes the seeds of peace. In others, the bread may rise, but it's not shared and people go hungry. We seek the growth of reconciliation and the flowering of justice. We pray for our church in these days of stretching and straining, afraid of the future and of those around us. We sometimes keep the seed of the kingdom rather than planting it. Sometimes we store the rising yeast instead of stirring it through. Help us to be the sowers of the word and the sharers of blessing that in our place and our time, all whom we meet might encounter the living God. We pray for our nation in all its diversity. We ask for those who must make decisions on our behalf, wise and discerning minds, that the right paths may be chosen and the whole people may be served. And we pray for those we know the best and love the most. For some of them these days are fretful and fearful. They suffer from confusion or despondency emptiness or addiction. Help us where we can to ease their burden and share their load. Even when it seems there is nothing we can do, we still hold them before you in the silence of our hearts. Eternal God, through the centuries you have called people into service and have equipped them with gifts for using and sharing in the kingdom's cause. We give thanks for their faithful service and we remember in particular those who sowed the seeds of faith in us. Keep strong our faith and enliven our witness that the Church of Jesus Christ may prosper and that many come to find for themselves the love of God from which nothing can separate us. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, who is our Saviour and our friend. Amen. We sing again, number 641, one of my very favourites. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, 641. <coughs>
about God's surprises. But first, there was a man who was very afraid of death. He was afraid that death would suddenly overtake him and find him unprepared. So he made a bargain with the grim reaper that he would give him clear, repeated notices before he would come. One day, however, unannounced and altogether unexpectedly, the destroyer appeared to demand his life. How could you break your pledge? The man protested bitterly. You sent me no warnings. Slowly, the skeletal figure replied, but how about your failing eyesight, your dimmed sense of hearing, your grey and thinning hair, your lost teeth, your furrowed face, your bent body, your dwindling powers and your weakened memory? Were these not unmistakable warnings? <laughs> it is amazing how many warnings we find in scripture. Time after time, Jesus reminds his hearers and followers of the judgment to come. And there is an unmistakable urgency to Jesus' message. In today's reading we heard, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are consequences to our actions and our faith and the final result is that the angels will come and sort out the righteous from the wicked. One will enter into the joy of God's kingdom and the other into everlasting torment. And the emphasis must be on the joy that comes from following Jesus, not the threat, the reward and not the punishment. In our text today, Jesus teaches by parables, five of them in all, about God's kingdom. So the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, like yeast, like treasure buried in a field, like a merchant in search of fine pearls, and like a net filled with fish, both good to eat, and as it says in the Greek, rotten fish. And each of these parables has a surprise, something unexpected. The mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but it grows into the greatest of shrubs, even a tree that birds can nest on its branches. It does not take much yeast to make a loaf of bread. And these parables are parallel. And here Jesus is saying that faith can appear small and insignificant, but it can change a whole life. And the next two parables are also twinned and are quite exciting. There is buried treasure and there is a pearl of great price. And we all like to hear stories of unexpected good fortune, from Aladdin to Treasure Island to Survivor. We like treasure maps and magic lamps and buried gold. It's said that Cleopatra once spent the equivalent of a million and a half pounds on a single pearl. The people of Jesus' world also like these stories. But the point of these parables is actually the unexpected nature of God. God comes to us when we least expect him and in wondrous ways. God's kingdom is so valuable, it's worth giving up everything for. And the final parable is of the fishing net full of gold, both good and bad fish, which are kept together until the boat reaches the shore and then the good fish are kept and the bad are thrown away. The theme is again 
that the church is a mixed company of righteous and wicked and will be so until the last day when the surprise is that that separation out does not come until the end. The kingdom of God is like Jesus taught in parables that are not always easy to understand. But in each one of these, the surprise comes from God. God causes the tiny mustard seed to grow into a huge tree. God uses the little bit of yeast to cause the loaf to rise. God has buried treasure where it is least expected, worth enough to sell everything in order to buy that field. And the pearl, great enough to give all that one has to purchase such a wonderful pearl. And God keeps adding fish to the net. So each parable has a surprise. Now, surprises can be a mixed blessing. Sometimes they work and other times they're not necessarily very much appreciated. My Auntie Maggie always had a slant on any present given to her. So if we bought her soap or bath cubes for Christmas, she would say, so you think I'm dirty then? And my granny never liked what we gave her. If we gave her a jumper, she'd go and change it for a pair of gloves. If we gave her gloves, she'd go back and change it for a jumper. So surprises can be disappointing, but not always. We can go to places where we didn't have any great expectations and find out we enjoy them. So a few years ago, the British Legion members here on Arran went to a visit to the Air Museum near Dumfries, which I actually enjoyed very much, but I didn't think I was going to. Uh, sometimes a restaurant that doesn't look like much actually has really good food. And sometimes there are folks that on an initial meeting don't impress us very much, but actually one day become very good friends. God's surprises do not disappoint us. Our parables tell us that. What looks little and insignificant can still make a great difference. Just look at the mustard seed or the yeast. The little seed produces a tree 10 feet tall. A wee pinch of yeast mixed with water and flowers can feed a hundred people. And it does not take too many believing, trusting, trusting Christians to make a difference in our community. Even a few of us living out our faith can do it. We should not be discouraged in our faith. That's the point of the first two parables. A few a little can do great things, many things. So God's kingdom itself is actually a wonderful surprise. It's like the treasure in the field or the pearl of great price. It is so wonderful that everything else pales into insignificance. The laborer sold all he had to buy the field. The merchant all his other pearls. It is a promise for us. If we are God's people, God's children, then other things do not matter so much. If we are not rich, so what? If we are not beautiful, trim, attractive, it doesn't matter. All flesh is grass anyway. As Isaiah says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. We may not be powerful people, but God's surprise for us is simply this. What counts in God's eyes is our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. God sees us in the light of Christ, forgiven, reconciled and restored. And it's a treasure indeed that we have from God, a jewel that's given to us by God that our future is secure in God's loving hands. We may not have what the world offers, power, prestige, money, 
But we have what the world cannot give, God's presence and God's peace. And God continues to surprise us. God comes to the little baby who's not old enough to understand and makes that child God's own through baptism. God comes to us in a word of forgiveness when we confess our sins. God comes to us in times of loneliness and sickness, in worry or pain. God can use extraordinary times or ordinary times to come near. And when we least expect God to act, God comes showering blessings. So we should not be discouraged when things go wrong, but realise that God is working out a plan of love and care for us. God has great treasures laid up for us, and the greatest of these is the kingdom of heaven. So finally, a person has just arrived at the gates of heaven. A voice asks, what is the password? Speak and you may enter. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? No, replies the voice. The just shall live by faith? No. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ? Those sayings are true, the voice answers, but they are not the password for which I listen. Well then, I give up, said the person. That's right, come on in. <laughs> the kingdom of God is a free gift given to those who know they cannot make it on their own and must rely on God's grace. God's surprise comforts us when it looks as though evil will triumph. Along with weeping and gnashing of teeth will come shouts of joy and thanksgiving. And that's God's final surprise, eternal life. Amen. Let's take a moment now to dedicate our offerings. Let us pray. Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord, both of our money and our lives, that we might make a difference on this island. We ask this through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was, that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen. Now, before we sing our closing hymn, I have something I want to share with you. Um, a slight aside to begin with, when uh, John and I were both in the army, one of the medals that you could be presented with was a, a long service and good conduct. Neither of us got that. <laughs> we did the long service. <laughs> However, today, I want to talk about somebody else. We Presbyterians are quite diffident about this thing called evangelism. It doesn't sit well with our rather self-effacing character. However, we are all, in one way or another, evangelical. Although most of us, I'm looking, are now shaking our heads in denial. However, any act of kindness, any kind word, however small, is a demonstration of outreach and of our desire to follow Christ's example on how to live. One of our members has been working away quietly for so many years, demonstrating this to us and to the valley. <clears throat> so it is appropriate that we take time to recognise this work. And it's not only us, but this is a token from the organisation this person has served for a long, long time. So, <laughs> not only 
do we recognize your work, Joan? But <laughs> Christian aid also has. So I would, I'm very proud to present you with this certificate. I don't know if you managed to get out for it. You think you'll make it with your wobbly leg. <laughs> I'd like it to be on the video. It says, Christian A presents this award to Joan Stewart. I'm going to cry. In recognition of an exceptional commitment to standing with the most vulnerable and excluded people. Your prayers, fundraising, and campaigning are helping to create a world where everyone can live a full life free from poverty. And I think I better stop. Congratulations. <laughs> Can I just say, excuse me, um, this isn't just for me, this is for all the people in the community who have helped over the years, supporting Christian Aid, walking the streets, collecting from door to door. Can I just say thank you so much for all your support over the years, it is much appreciated and I think you should all get one of these. Thank you. Follow that. <laughs> Actually, Joan, we're going to have another one of your talents now as we sing our final hymn. Number 722, Spirit of God, come dwell within me. 722.
Jesus draws to him. May the power of Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of Lord Jesus fill our souls. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us always. Thank you.